Two miles of healthy lives in the Ad Council. You're listening to BostonFreeRadio.com. Hello and welcome to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic Dan Burke, and the views and opinions expressed on this show about movies or otherwise are solely those of your host and movie critic Dan Burke. They do not necessarily reflect the respective views of any individual employees of the station airing this broadcast or the station as a whole. (coughs) Excuse me. I've got five movies to review for you for this show, but first let's get into my segment before I choke on my own saliva again. What's topping the box office? These are the top ten highest grossing films of this past weekend. Again, these movies are not necessarily winners at the box office. Some are, some aren't, but I'll let you know that as we go through them. So, I'm actually kind of surprised that the number one movie at the box office is what it is, but it was the number one movie last week, and that movie is The Hitman's Bodyguard. This weekend, it made $10.3 million in its second week in release. Against a budget of $30 million, The Hitman's Bodyguard has so far made, in the United States, $39.8 million, and around the world, it has made $61.1 million, which means it is a tentative hit here in the States. Internationally, it is a certified hit already, just by an inch. Annabelle Creation is number two at the box office this weekend, as it was last weekend. It was also number two last week. In its third week in release, Annabelle Creation has made $7.7 million. Against a budget of $15 million, that's $1.5 million, Annabelle Creation has so far made, in the United States, $78.2 million in just three weeks. Around the world, even more astonishingly, it has made $216.8 million. So it goes without saying that Annabelle Creation is a certified hit here in the States and around the world, and it actually deserves to be more of a hit than its predecessor, Annabelle. I can't say the same about the Conjuring movies because I haven't seen those. I've seen only Annabelle and Annabelle Creation, but I can tell you that Annabelle Creation was a much better film. The movie Leap, known here in the United States as Leap, but around the world as Ballerina, is number three at the box office this weekend, having grossed just $4.7 million, and that's against a budget of $30 million. Now, Ballerina, or rather the movie Leap as it's known here, actually opened in the in France and the United Kingdom in December of last year, and it opened up in Canada on February 24th of this year. So this is its U.S. debut. But that explains that around the world it has so far made $86.1 million on a budget of $30 million. I don't think it will make its money back here in the States. It's $30 million, but here in the States it's not a hit, but around the world it is already a certified hit. Wind River, in its fourth week in release, is number four at the box office this weekend, having the biggest climb from it being number 10 last week. But Wind River was open to a national release this week. As I said, it made $4.6 million. Against a budget of $11 million, it has made so far $10 million even here in the States, and around the world it has made $11.7 million, meaning that it's not a hit yet here in the States, but it will be by next week. And around the world, it is a tentative hit. Just very marginally tentative hit. Logan Lucky, in its second week in release, is number five at the box office this weekend, sliding from number three last week. Logan Lucky has so far made four point, or rather, this weekend it made $4.2 million. Against a budget of $29 million, Logan Lucky has so far made $14.9 million here in the States and $15.9 million around the world, which means that in every other country besides the United States, Logan Lucky has only made $1 million. So Logan Lucky is struggling, which is really unfortunate because if you take my word for it, Logan Lucky is a much, much better movie than The Hitman's Bodyguard. So I, I'm really actually kind of sorry for the movie that it's not doing as well as I think it should, but it's still hanging in there, so we'll see how it does by next week. 
Dunkirk is number six at the box office this weekend, sliding slightly from number four last week. This weekend, Dunkirk made $3.9 million. Against a budget of $100 million, Dunkirk has so far made in the United States $172.5 million, and around the world has made $412.6 million, making it a tentative hit here in the States, but around the world, it goes without saying, it is a certified hit. Spider-Man Homecoming is number seven at the box office this weekend, and it was also number seven last week, interestingly enough. So it's holding steady, having grossed $2.8 million at the box office this weekend in its eighth week in release. Against a budget of $175 million, Spider-Man Homecoming has made $318.9 million here in the States and $737.1 million around the world. So Spider-Man Homecoming has to make $350 million for it to be a certified hit in my book. It hasn't made that yet. It is only... Uh, well, I could do the math. I, I can't really do it that quickly right now, but it's very close to being a certified hit, but yet so far away. But around the world, it is already a certified hit, so good for Spider-Man Homecoming. Birth of the Dragon is the second highest grossing debut movie of the week, but it is number eight at the box office this weekend, having only made $2.7 million in the United States this weekend. Now, I don't have how much money this costs to make. I don't have its budget, and I also don't have its international numbers, so I can't say for sure whether Birth of the Dragon is a hit of any kind, but I'm guessing it's not. Mayweather vs. McGregor is actually the number nine highest grossing something of this weekend. It's not a movie. It was obviously a fight that was simulcast in the theaters, but it's actually very encouraging that this movie placed as high as it did at the box office because this was a height... This was a movie that, or rather a fight, that caused a lot of hype, definitely in the sports papers. And it actually is an encouraging sign that movies are still going to be up and running, even with pay-per-view and Netflix, even especially during these live events. So I can't say whether this movie is a hit of any sort, but it's in the top ten, and that's the first time I've ever seen a high-profile fight like Mayweather versus McGregor in the top 10. So moving on. Sadly, the Emoji Movie is still in the top 10, but the encouraging news is that last week it was number 6, this week it was number 10, having made $2.5 million. So people had the good sense to see the Mayweather vs. McGregor fight more than the Emoji Movie. But on a budget of $50 million, the Emoji Movie has made $76.6 million here in the States and $144.3 million around the world, making it a tentative hit here in the States, certified hit worldwide. Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I am your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and I'm just here to remind you that you are listening to Words on Film on bostonfreeradio.com, watching me on either Somerville Community Access Television or a community television station that is kind enough to air this broadcast. Thank you for whoever picked it up. And you are also watching and listening to me on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page or probably on Boston Free Radio's Facebook page. Either way you could join me, I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. The first movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is an animated film that came out of France and was a co-production between Canadian and French companies. In every other place besides the United States, the movie is called Ballerina. But you probably know, if you are listening or watching in the United States, you probably know the movie as Leap. And Leap is a movie that probably should have been called Ballerina here in the States because Leap doesn't really, as a title, tell you what the movie is about or even give you a hint about what it's about. In other words, Leap is a little bit of a vague title, so I wasn't really impressed by the English translation of that title. But Leap is an animated movie, a completely animated movie, about an orphan girl who dreams of becoming a ballerina and flees her rural Brittany, which is a small town in France, for Paris, where she passes for someone else and accedes to the position of pupil at the Grand Opera House. This is a movie that's directed by Eric Summer. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that in its traditional French way, but Eric Summer is indeed a French director, and he is actually from the town of Brittany, France. That's, 
I, I don't know if that's actually where he was born, but he certainly started his career there, directing shorts, advertising spots, and corporate videos. I believe that this movie is his first animated film, but don't quote me on that. He's directed, as I said, a number of television shows that are native of France, and the... Well, I can't really get into the movies he's he's directed, but either way, he's he's had a lot of directing experience. I believe this is his first film. So the English dub of this film is actually done really well. It's probably the biggest asset of the film because obviously it was done by French people for French people, which is why it was a co-production of Canada, probably a film studio in Quebec, and France. But for this re-release, and probably the reason that this film opened much later in the United States than it did in Canada or France and the United Kingdom, this English translation actually has the characters in the movie have their mouths move along to their celebrity voiceovers done by mostly American voiceover artists, including Elle Fanning, who's the voice of the said orphan, Felice, who is the orphan girl who runs away from her orphanage in Brittany and goes to France to become a ballet dancer. There's also Victor, who's her other orphan friend, who's voiced in this movie by Nat Wolf. And interestingly enough, Dane DeHaan was supposed, was supposed to do the voice of Victor, but he backed out of the movie for reasons I don't know. Other American voiceover artists in this movie include Carly Rae Jepsen, who is best known for her song Call Me Maybe. She's not a one-hit wonder. She's actually had a couple of other hits after Call Me Maybe, even though she, she was kind of stigmatized as a one-hit wonder, but apparently she is doing voice acting as well in animated movies. And she plays the part of Camille, who is the mentor for Felici when the odds are against Felici joining the Grand Opera as a premier ballerina. And there's also the brief voice over of Mel Brooks, who plays the orphanage director, Luto. And you don't instantly recognize Mel Brooks's voice. He doesn't try to do a French accent, but he does something with his voice that makes it distinctly different from either other animated characters he's done or certainly from the movies he's done in the past. And last but not least amongst the voice actors who you might know from this movie are is Kate McKinnon, who actually does not one, not two, but three characters in this movie. And she's one of those... She certainly has a lot of versatility in her voice. And I think that actually all the voice actors in this movie were well cast. The problem with this movie is the animation, which is CGI, is not particularly remarkable. As a matter of fact, there are no anthropomorphic characters in this movie. Every single character in this movie is a human, which makes me kind of wonder why they didn't just film the movie. I think that probably would have been a little bit... I think that would have been a given. And instead, the the animation is not particularly impressive, and I thought the ballet dancing in this movie was pretty good, but the way the other characters actually walked made them look like rusty robots. So I wasn't really into the animation other than the ballet dancing, because the ballet dancing, you can certainly see they put a lot of effort into that kind of fluid mo movement, and it looked really believable. I'm not sure if they used motion capture animation, but either way, the ballet dancing was good. Unfortunately, the story itself, once I tell you that it's about an orphan girl who goes to the big city and tries to make something of herself, it's a pretty predictable story. Once Carly Ray Jepsen's character is introduced and you see she has a limp, I could automatically guess that she was someone who had hopes of being a ballerina herself, just from the fact that she carried a crutch, and also from the fact that the main character, Felice, automatically writes her off as someone who maybe didn't want to be a, a ballerina, just kind of hangs around the grand opera cleaning up things because it's a living. Of course, if you know anything about these Rags to Riches movies, you know that's absolutely not the case. 
I remember chuckling a few times during this film, but there was nothing in this film that really struck me. Again, it's not a bad film, but it gets my rating of a strikeout because it's not particularly memorable. I do think that girls would probably like it, but in terms of the animation, it reminded me a lot of those direct-to-video Barbie films. Although, I will say, the clips of those direct-to-video video Barbie films I've actually seen, I've never seen one to, from beginning to end because I'm a guy and I don't have daughters or a girlfriend who watches that, but... The, the Barbie films look scary. This doesn't look quite as scary, but it's still not very good. Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Birth of the Dragon, which is a semi-biopic of Bruce Lee, but it's not a biopic because it is a fictionalized account of an alleged fight that went on between Bruce Lee and another Kung Fu master who is not quite as well known, but still revered in Bruce Lee's native Hong Kong, Wong Jack Man. And this is set against the backdrops of 1960s San Francisco, and it's a modern take, or at least that's what the, the tagline says, a modern take on the classic movies for which Bruce Lee was known. It takes its inspiration from the epic and still controversial showdown between an up-and-coming Bruce Lee and Kung Fu master Wong Jack Man, a battle that gave birth to a legend. So, both Bruce Lee and Wong Jack Man were Kung Fu masters of equal ability, I think, but their approach to Kung Fu was different. And that's what I probably found the most fascinating about this movie. So Bruce Lee in this movie, who's played by a relative newcomer, whose name is, if you'll just bear with me, Philip Ng, is n not exactly an up-and-coming martial artist. I mean, he was certainly a man in his early 20s when this, when this movie takes place, 1964. But... I guess he was up and coming in the sense that he was still making a name for himself in the United States, but he wasn't a movie star yet. And one of the things this movie gets wrong is that the movie actually shows in a scene that takes place in 1964, him filming scenes for a movie for which he's the star. But his first movie actually came out in 1969. But then again, the way these Kung Fu movies are distributed, it might have been shot in 1964, came out in 1969. I don't know. But either way, Bruce Lee was not particularly well known, at least not on the legendary level he is today, when this movie took place. But Bruce Lee made enough of a name for himself in San Francisco to draw the ear of such originators of Kung Fu who were not particularly impressed with the fact that Bruce Lee was introducing Kung Fu to a Western audience or Western students. And that fact particularly comes among some controversy in this movie when one of his students is a Caucasian by the name of Steve McKee, who's played by Billy Magnuson. And you might notice that Billy Magnuson is a little bit of a doppelganger for a movie star who happened to study under Bruce Lee. And the fact that his name is Steve McKee in this movie tells you that he's probably loosely based on a movie star that has a name very similar to Steve McKee. Think about that. Steve McKee. You're probably thinking to yourself, Steve McQueen. That's exactly what I thought to myself. But the difference between Steve McKee in this movie and Steve McQueen in real life is that Steve McKee in this film is not a jerk. Whereas Steve McQueen was not the nicest person in the world in his real life. I'm not, I'm not disparaging his on-screen presence or his legend as a, as a movie star. That's all well and good, but in real life, Steve McQueen was a bit of a jerk, at least from what I've read. He was also quite sexist, which doesn't really bode very well for Billy Magnuson in this film when he is not an up-and-coming actor, unlike Bruce Lee, who, who says in this movie that he is an up-and-coming actor, but he is a guy who trains under Bruce Lee and kind of falls in between allegiance to Bruce Lee and Wong Jack Man. Bruce Lee tells Steve McKee that he can't have two masters, which 
I guess you really can't, but then again, I don't know too much about Kung Fu. I've never taken a class. But Steve, anyway, befriends and wants to learn as much from Wong Jack Man as he can. So the best part about this movie is actually the fight between Bruce Lee and Wong Jack Man. And one thing I should note is that one of the distributors of this movie is WWE Films. So very much like another WWE film that came out earlier this year, Slight, or Slate, it's spelled S-L-E-I-G-H-T. I'm going to pronounce it Slight for now. There are no wrestlers in this movie. But unlike Slight, this movie is about fighting, which I think makes it a pretty good fit for WWE. But this movie has undergone a lot of controversy, particularly amongst the Asian American community. So... Seeing the movie, I thought it was okay. Definitely the fight between Bruce Lee and Wong Jack Man was worth the price of admission in and of itself. But a lot of people, particularly diehard Bruce Lee fans and Asian Americans, were upset with the supporting role that Billy Magnuson had in this movie. It, they accused this movie of whitewashing, which I kind of understand but at the same time if bruce lee himself in this movie was played by a caucasian person that would be whitewashing if there's a caucasian person who wants to know about kung fu from an asian master i don't think that's whitewashing but at the same time i don't exactly think that Steve McKee should have been loosely based on Steve McQueen i i think that if there was if if Steve McKee, Billy Magnuson had less of a supporting role in this movie, I think that would have benefited the movie a lot better. But in terms of Asian stereotyping, again, I'm not Asian American at all. I don't even have 1 16th Asian American blood in me that I know of. So I can't speak for the Asian American community as to what would offend them about the film. But I did have the feeling that the Bruce Lee I saw in this film, from what I know about Bruce Lee, wasn't exactly a accurate to the man or the legend. Like, for instance, there's a report by, or a, at least a press release from Bruce Lee's only living daughter, that Bruce Lee did not engage in street fighting at all. He kept his fighting in the training room, or, for lack of a better term, in the ring. And I, I definitely respect that. And I do have to say that this movie is also based on one article about the fight between Bruce Lee and Wong Jack Man, which was only witnessed by about 12 people. So that's why it's, it's shrouded in mystery. But there are so many other articles written about this fight, and I wish that the movie hadn't started with the fact that they're saying that it was inspired by this fight. I'm giving it a strikeout because I feel like there's something that's left out of here. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is All Saints. This is a movie that is indeed a religious film, but unlike other religious films I've seen recently, like God's Not Dead 2, I don't feel like this is a religious film that beats you over the head with a Bible. In other words, it's not propaganda. It is definitely unabashedly religious. It's definitely Christian, but it's not a film that tell that implies that if you don't devote your life to Jesus Christ and if you don't tell everyone you know about his power and his glory, then you might as well be a fire-breathing satanist. Fortunately to this move to this movie's credit, All Saints does not do that. And I expected this movie to actually be in the top 10. It isn't, and which is too bad because it is actually a better movie than God's Not Dead 2 or Do You Believe or any of those other movies that, again, are Christian propaganda. But anyway, All Saints is indeed based on a true story, and it's about a church, a Protestant church. I'd like to say Presbyterian, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, it, it's Anglican. That's what it's described as but this struggling church when a group of burmese refugees join the congregation the pastor of a failing anglican church attempts to aid them by planting crops and enlisting the help of the community so the pastor in this movie is actually somebody who exists in real life 
He is a pastor by the name of Michael Spurlock, who in this movie is played by John Corbett. And Michael Spurlock is a New York native who moves to rural Tennessee, along with his wife Amy, played by Cara Buono, who you probably know from her stints on Mad Men and actually on for her regular role on the Netflix hit Stranger Things. But anyway, the two of them move along with their son Atticus, who's played by a young boy named Miles Moore, to this church in small town Tennessee, and they take over for Bishop Eldon Thompson, who's played by Gregory Allen Williams, who is the only black person in this movie, or at least the only black person who has a role in this movie. So the church is struggling, and Michael Spurlock is brought in not only to be the replacement pastor, but also to aid the transition from this small church that's about to be taken over by some real estate giant to another probably bigger church. And when Michael Spurlock first joins this church, there are only 12 people who regularly attend, all of whom are white. But eventually, Michael Spurlock begins to distribute flyers all over town, and the flyers get the attention of some Burmese refugees who are known as the uh, as Karin. And I'm not sure if Karin is the name of this this group of people, or if it's the name of the region in Burma, also known as Myanmar, from which they hail. But either way, they are known as the Karin, and that's spelled K-A-R-E-N, so it looks like Karen, but it's pronounced Karin, and it sounds a little bit like Korean, or the word Korean, which is which is the source of an understandable amount of confusion in the very beginning of this movie amongst these characters. But amongst the... Burmese refugees, and I'll just call them Burmese, is their their one man named Yi Win, who's played by Nelson Lee. And eventually, these Burmese refugees join these church in droves, uh, much to the chagrin of the regular church attendees. And there might have been a little bit of racism involved in some other church members' objections to them joining this church, but that racism is painted over in this movie. But anyway, Michael Corbett, who again is played by, excuse me, Michael Spurlock, who's played by John Corbett, gets the idea to save the church by enlisting these Burmese refugees who have experience in farming to actually start, make this church multi-purpose, both a church for special purpose and farming for agriculture. The only problem is this Pastor Spurlock has no experience farming, and farming is much easier said than done. You have to have the right equipment, you have to have experience, and you also have to have someone who knows what they're doing. Now, there is one person who attends church by the name of Forrest, who's played by Barry Corbin in this movie, and he is probably the poor man's Wilford Brimley. He is somebody who wears his religion on his sleeve, yes, but he's also a curmudgeon and is very reluctant to help Pastor Spurlock start this farm. And I guess in this movie, he's a bit of a curmudgeon just for the sake of being a curmudgeon. And a lot of this movie, to to the film's credit, is based on fact. Where it gets to be really good is where, in other lesser religious movies... I think they would have painted over how hard it is to start such a project, particularly creating a farm not only to feed the starving Burmese refugees, but also to sell the crops and make a pay off the mortgage for the church so that it can be saved. So I'm not going to tell you whether or not they do that, but I will tell you that the, the movie emphasizes how hard it is for these people to get this farm going. And that's what I liked best about the movie. The, the, the parts of this movie I like best are the same parts I liked about the movie Miracles from Heaven from last year, starring Jennifer Garner. Other lesser religious films make you believe that if you believe in God, if you devote yourself to Jesus Christ and his name and memorize all the scriptures, you will be okay. 
But that's not always the case. Sometimes bad things happen to good people, to pious people. And the movie deals with how even the most devotedly religious people have to un- have to deal with or have to answer to these difficulties such as the ones that Job went through in the Bible. And I think that's a very important message. Again, it's not a movie you're probably going to love if you're not religious. I'm spiritual, I'd like to say, but I did like this for what it was. I give this movie a checkout. It's not a knockout because there are some cliched movie characters that I didn't think should have been as cliched as they were. I, I definitely think that some of the characters were a little bit too two-dimensional, but not John Corbett and, I, and not Cara Buono in this movie. I thought they did well. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and the next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is The Only Living Boy in New York. This is a movie directed by Mark Webb and written by Alan Loeb. Uh, Mark Webb has actually been involved with a number of movies. uh, As he's directed a number of he's directed a number of films, including this past year's or this past, earlier this year, he directed Gifted, or it came out earlier this year. That's the one with Chris Evans, McKenna Grace, and Jenny Slate, amongst other people. That was a really good film, I thought. Some people who, who saw it thought it was a little predictable. Maybe it was a little bit, but Mark Webb has also directed The Amazing Spider-Man 2, and actually the both Amazing Spider-Man movies, starring Andrew Garfield. And 500 Days of Summer, which I thought was probably one of the most unique romantic comedies of the century so far. So, The Only Living Boy in New York is indeed a unique film. It draws some comparisons to, I would probably say, The Catcher in the Rye. But the the boy in this movie, the titular Only Living Boy in New York, is a little older than... Holden Caulfield, but there's there's some Holden Caulfield tendencies about him, but I'll get into that in a moment. But The Only Living Boy in New York is a, takes place in New York City, and it's about a recent college graduate's life that is upended by his father's mistress. That's the tagline of the movie. I think that the, boy, the, the guy in this movie, who's definitely in his early 20s, whose name is Thomas Webb, and he's played by a British actor named Callum Turner, is... Not ex- I don't think he's a college graduate. I think he actually dropped out of college. But he has a he has a friend who's a who's a woman who's whose name is Mimi, and she's played by Kiersey Clemens, who you might remember from Neighbors Two and another a couple of other films. But anyway, the the two of them have a bit of a flirtation. But Mimi actually has a boyfriend, which. I think is a brilliant way to explain how these two really good-looking people aren't dating, but I'm I'm totally sold by the fact that they could be friends with a little bit of flirtation in there. I, I totally get that. And they make a good on-screen couple for sure. But Thomas Webb begins to befriend somebody who lives in his building named W.F. Gerald, who's played by Jeff Bridges. And Jeff Bridges is playing the same kind of character he's played in other movies. And that's not a that's not a rip on Jeff Bridges. He's actually very good at playing that character who's a little bit of a curmudgeon, but he's also somebody who serves as somewhat of a mentor and also a, a shoulder to lean on for the main character. And I love Jeff Bridges in this movie. I thought he was definitely the best actor in this film. But to be honest, everyone in this film is really great, especially the the principal actors. So... Thomas Webb's parents in this movie are Ethan, his, fa- his father, I-, I think it's his father and not his stepfather, who's played by Pierce Brosnan, who is a publishing magnet, and he also has a somewhat depressive mother named Judith, who's played by Cynthia Nixon. So, Pierce Brosnan's character is actually cheating on Cynthia Nixon's character with a woman named Joanna, who is a co-worker played by Kate Beckinsale. And Kate Beckinsale 
in the right movie can not only act really well, but she can also be really, really sexy. I said in last year's review for Love and Friendship, which not enough people saw, I don't think, that Kate Beckinsale was was sexy in this in that movie without showing any skin. She was wearing long dresses of the you know early 1800s period with long sleeves. So the only skin you could see on her was her face and her hands. That was it. But she was still interestingly sexy in that movie. This movie, you see a lot more skin. <laughs> Especially when Thomas Webb, Callum Turner's character, actually has an affair with Joanna. So he actually has an affair with his father's mistress, which I suppose there's nothing wrong with that. I think there's probably a lot more wrong with adultery than a, a guy cheating on his father's mistress. In fact, that that's devastating to find out if one of your parents is actually cheating on the other one. I know I wouldn't want to find that out. I wouldn't want to discover that. And yeah, I wouldn't even want to even fathom the thought of that happening. But it's appalling to think, but I suppose it happens. So this movie takes some interesting love triangles, which I think in this movie is more like a love dodecahedron or one of those multi, you know, one of those shapes with more than three or four sides. And it's certainly the affair here causes a lot of tension between Thomas Webb and his friend who's a girl, Mimi. And once you, I, I can't give anything away in this film, but it's a film that certainly has a lot of originality to it. It is sexy. It's also very enticing. And once the, the drama hits, it hits hard. Once certain people know certain things about other certain characters. And I hate to leave it that vague, but I don't want to spoil this movie for you. That's one of my rules on this show. No spoilers unless absolutely necessary. And it is absolutely necessary that you see this film rather than me spoiling it for you. So I got about a minute and 12 seconds to go for this segment, but I will tell you that this gets my rating of a knockout. It's released by Amazon Studios and Roadside Attractions, so because it's released by Amazon Studios, you might be able to see this streaming sooner than you think. But if you check, if check your local listings, particularly for your art house cinemas, and if this movie is at your art house cinema or at your multiplex, I definitely recommend checking out. It is a drama, but there are certain lighthearted elements to it, and it also is sexy. And I really like that about the movie. I thought Thomas, uh, rather, Callum Turner made a really good leading man, and I certainly think he has a future ahead of him for leading roles. I like Kiersey Clemens a lot, and I like to see her actually get bigger and better roles the more movies she's in. Although she is a doppelganger for actress Tessa Thompson, but hey, they're both beautiful. <laughs> I would kill to have either of them be my girlfriend. But... Kate Beckinsale is also the, the big standout in this movie, and not to mention Jeff Bridges, good as always. So I highly recommend The Only Living Boy in New York. Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Ingrid Goes West. This is a movie that's been put in independent release. It certainly wasn't in the top 10 um in my segment, What's Topping the Box Office, but I really liked it, which probably gives away what rating I'm going to give it, but it's a movie about an unhinged social media stalker who moves to L.A. and insinuates herself into the life of an Instagram star. The movie stars Aubrey Plaza in a role she hasn't really played before. She plays the titular Ingrid Thornburn, who is obsessed with social media, probably unhealthily. She is definitely hooked on her Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram accounts, probably to the point where it is an addiction. And you find out very early on in the film that Ingrid, despite the fact that she really is beautiful, she is, after all, Aubrey Plaza, doesn't have any friends and is a little bit of a recluse. Well, after an altercation with one of the women she thought was her friends, who thought was one of her friends, who did not invite her to her wedding, 
Aubrey Plaza's character spends time in a mental institution and then comes out and finds out that after her mother died, she is given a rather hefty inheritance. So despite this inheritance and the fact that she can live quite well without having a job for a little while, she finds herself still hooked on her social media accounts and eventually finds an Instagram star by the name of Taylor Sloan, who's played in this movie by Elizabeth Olsen. So Aubrey, uh, Aubrey Plaza's character becomes obsessed with Elizabeth Olsen's character and also the image that she conveys as a social media star and the various hashtags and photographs she posts to her account, whether it be Twitter or Instagram. And Aubrey Plaza's character eventually sells her house, collects her mother's inheritance, late mother's inheritance, and moves to L.A., eventually finding twisted ways to get within the social circle of Elizabeth Olsen's character. Along the way, she befriends a, a landlord of hers in L.A. by the name of Dan Pinto, who's played in this movie by O'Shea Jackson Jr. And O'Shea Jackson Jr. is a name that probably won't be familiar to you yet, but he's best known for playing the role of Ice Cube in 2015's Straight Outta Compton. And the reason he looks so much like Ice Cube probably has to do with the fact that Ice Cube's real name is O'Shea Jackson Sr. In other words... O'Shea Jackson Jr. is Ice Cube's son. Well, to O'Shea Jackson Jr.'s credit in this movie, he made me forget that he's related to Ice Cube. In other words, he showed enough versatility in this movie and enough charisma as an actor in the role he had in this film that I think he has a bright future ahead of him as an actor despite the perceived nepotism in his show business career. I thought he was really good good in this movie as a guy who is independent and also obsessed with Batman. And I, I like that part about him. But I thought the the scenes between him and Aubrey Plaza, who with whose with whom's character he has, he eventually begins a relationship what were really genuine, both when they were just friends and also when they're Friendship begins developing into something more. I also thought that Aubrey Plaza herself really anchored this film. <clears throat> and it also showed that very much like O'Shea Jackson Jr. playing more than just his father, I thought this showed that Aubrey Plaza can play more than just a jaded millennial or a jaded uh, Generation Y girl. She also showed a lot of depth in her performance. And again, you would think that Aubrey Plaza being as attractive as she, she is wouldn't have any problem making friends, even Instagram stars. But I think there were scenes that showed Aubrey Plaza's desperation to show that a lot of this feeling outcast is all in her head. And there's a certain amount of unhingedness and also, or if that is a word, and also quite a bit of addiction on her part. And I think this is the very first movie that emphasizes the addiction that social media can have on someone. That somebody can legitimately have a Facebook addiction and it's not exactly a joke. And I, I think that's actually an important thing to note. There, there are various addictions to things. You, you can get addicted to just about anything. And the, the addictions that are the most complicated are the ones where you're addicted to something you might need. For instance, sex addiction is complicated because sex is natural. Overeating is complicated because you do need to eat. The question is about how much. And social media is also a bit of a complex addiction because you there is a need to be social and there is a need to put yourself out there and there's nothing wrong with that. But when you do it too much, there can be drastic consequences. So I think that Ingrid Goes West is a movie that is a somewhat complicated comedy with dramatic elements, very much quirkily to the... It's, it's quirky in the same way that the movie I reviewed last week, 
Brigsby Bear is, but it's not off-putting. There's something that's very human about it and something that's very vulnerable. And to Aubrey Plaza's credit, she shows a lot of vulnerability in her role. I thought actually one of the most heartbreaking scenes was when she and Elizabeth Olsen's character are driving and they're singing along to the song All My Life by Casey and JoJo. And there are certain lyrics to the song that have a feeling of poignancy or desperation. And the way Aubrey Plaza looks at Elizabeth Olsen is heartbreaking. And you think, you know, Aubrey Plaza's character doesn't need to be obsessed with this girl. She just, with this woman, this this Instagram star, all she needs to do is just go up and introduce herself. But you can understand the insecurity of Aubrey Plaza's character. So there's a lot to like about Ingrid Goes West. I thought everybody in the film did a great acting job. Aubrey Plaza, as I said, showed a lot of poignancy. O'Shea Jackson Jr. showed a lot of charisma. Elizabeth Olsen shows she can be a great leading actress as well. It gets my rating of a knockout in case you didn't know it already. This is a film that should be streaming very soon. I recommend you check it out. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. Now I'm going to start my next segment, which is what's coming out next. This is a verbal preview of the movies that are coming out this coming weekend, maybe or maybe not to a theater near you. And to be honest, the pickings in terms of movies that are coming out this coming weekend, Labor Day weekend, are kind of slim right now. The last weekend in August and the first weekend of September are usually not particularly that great for movies. It's probably the worst time for movies. I'm not necessarily saying that movies that come out are bad. Some are. But it's not like January where you have the worst of movies and the best of movies. They're kind of movies that are somewhat in the middle. So it's, But it's slow particularly because only a couple of movies come out in theaters nationwide and maybe even worldwide these two weekends the weekend after this when school gets started for a lot of people not for me thankfully is when the movies really start to pick up again when the when the fall selection becomes more plentiful but for now there are a couple of movies that are coming in wide release supposedly one of them is a movie that looks to be an oscar contender and that is tulip fever this is about an artist who falls for a young married woman while he's commissioned to paint her portrait during the tulip mania of 17th century amsterdam so 17th century meaning the 1600s so i don't know what the tulip mania is i assume it's a good thing i guess I don't know, but this movie will explain it to you. The movie stars Academy Award winner Alicia Vikander. It also stars Dane DeHaan, Jack O'Connell, and Holiday Granger. And my guess from the fact that Alicia Vikander is seen on the poster and she's also given the top billing that she is the young married woman for whom the artist falls in this movie. So Alicia Vikander still looks damn good. I gotta tell you that. Uh, it's interesting to me that two years ago, in 2015, Alicia Vikander was in four films that were released that year, and she's been not quite as um, visible in other movies. And it just seems so ironic to me because one of the movies she won the Academy Award for Best Supporting Actress. I did think it was somewhat well-deserved, although I thought she was nominated for the wrong movie, but that's another story. But either way, Tulip Fever is a movie I probably will see for next week. I will let you know what I think of it on next week's show, unless otherwise noted. Another film that's coming out this weekend is one called Unlocked. This is about a CIA investigator who is lured into a ruse that puts London at risk of a biological attack. The movie stars N N Numi Rapace. I hope I pronounced that name right. She's the Swedish actress who is in the Swedish versions of the Girl with the Dragon, the Dragon Tattoo movies. Not the American version. That was uh, Rooney Mara. But in Sweden, all three of those movies, the the girl with the dragon tattoo, the girl who kicked the hornet's nest, and the girl who played with fire were made into movies. In America, they were only made into one movie, the girl with the dragon tattoo. But Nomi Rapace is becoming a, a bankable star in the U.S. on her own right. 
uh, even though I can't pronounce her name right, or at least I don't know how to pronounce her name. But anyway, Numi Rapace is in that movie along with Orlando Bloom, Tony Collette, and Michael Douglas. So this is this is a movie that looks pretty intense. It certainly has a roster of really good actors in it. And I will probably see this movie if it's out in a theater near me. And I will let you know what I think next week, unless otherwise noted. Another movie that's coming out this weekend is actually a re-release, a 40th anniversary re-release of Close Encounters of the Third Kind. This is a classic movie. And, well... I would love to see this movie on the big screen. I've only seen it on TV and on DVD. Granted, on DVD is probably better than seeing it on VHS, but it is such a great movie. I love it. It's one of those movies that is that has stood the test of time so well. Yes, it's a little slow in some parts, and it seems to take forever for the aliens to come out of their spaceship, but my God, I love this movie. <laughs> it's one of those movies that's really grown on me. And for those of you who don't know, it's directed by Steven Spielberg. It's the movie he did after Jaws. And it stars Richard Dreyfuss, Terry Garr, and Melinda Dillon. And if I'm not mistaken, I think Melinda Dillon was actually nominated for an Oscar for Best Supporting Actress for this movie. Don't quote me on that, but I know she was nominated at one point. I think it might have been for this movie, but I don't know. But either way, Richard Dreyfuss is really great on it, great in it. And if you get to see it in theaters... I highly recommend it. It's one of those movies that probably needs to be seen on the big screen. But anyway, that's all for Words on Film for this week. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And very quickly, just a reminder that the views and opinions expressed on this show about movies or otherwise are solely those of yours truly, your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. They do not necessarily reflect the respective views of any individual employees of the stations airing this broadcast or the station as a whole. With that said, I'm Dan Burke saying I'll see you at the movies.